Great. Hi there, everybody. I'm Hillary Lambert, Executive Director of the Cube Lake Watershed Network. And we are starting our second session of our fall community conference. Um, and today we have three presenters talking to you about different aspects of the situation regarding the invasive species hydrilla in Cuba Lake uh, during the 2021 um, season. And uh, before I introduce and you, Lynn Leopold, I found. Please, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, um, before I get start, introduce the first speaker, I'd just like to say we've been at this now for 10 years. Uh, Hydrilla was first found at the south end of the lake in uh, Itka, uh, Cuga Inlet in 2011. Um, and um, at that time, um, we mounted a kind of homemade ad hoc out of the blue response. Fortunately, a lot of people have come along to help since then. Um, but I re remember at that time, Roxy Johnston, City of Ithaca, um, learning from the experts in other places about hydrilla and saying that we will need public outreach and involved citizen and um, volunteer uh, support to keep people's eye on hydrilla and to keep people engaged for many years to come. And at that time, the estimate was kind of seven years. <laughs> well, here we are um, at 10 years in. And I think we've got three great speakers here today to give you a sense of um, the status of hydrilla um, on Cuga Lake now and into the next few years. Uh, each speaker is going to speak for about 20 minutes. We'll give uh, five minutes after each speaker for questions and answers. And then if, if things go smoothly at the end, uh, we ought to have a few more minutes uh, for folks to uh, have some give and take. So um, our first speaker is Kate or Catherine Monticelli, and she's the Hydrilla Project Manager uh, at Hobart and William Smith College uh, Finger Lakes Institute in Geneva, New York. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Hillary. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, let's get my presentation shared. And you can see that okay? Hopefully. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Looks great. Great. All right, so I'm Kate. I manage the Hydrilla project at the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Um, I'll just give a brief update on what we've been doing with Hydrilla this year. Uh, and to provide a little bit of context of where we're working, um, I know this meeting is specifically for Cayuga Lake Hydrilla, but we are also working across these 17 counties of the Finger Lakes PRISM, our Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. <clears throat> and just in case there's a chance, somebody is not completely familiar with hydrilla yet in the past 10 years on Cayuga Lake. Um, it is a submersed aquatic perennial plant. It overwinters uh, as tubers, um, extremely invasive grows along long slender stems. They are very uh, brittle. They fragment very easily. Uh, key identifying features are the, the whorls of leaves. Uh, the whorls are usually five leaves and they are toothed. Um, so those are really the first two things we look for when we're IDing hydrilla. Spreads very easily via fragmentation. As I mentioned, it's very brittle. So if the plant breaks and gets caught on something like um, a boat prop or a trailer, it can spread very easily. Um, and once it establishes, it, it forms very, very dense mats of vegetation. It's very good at outcompeting uh, our native aquatic plants. Um, and we're, we're really 
trying to catch any any new infestations when they're early, because that is when uh, it requires much fewer resources to manage. We have greater chances of eradicating any populations if we can catch them when they're small. So we need to try to detect any hydrilla populations as quickly as we can while continuing to control and monitor the, the hydrilla infestations that we are currently aware of. Um, so when we're looking for new populations of hydrilla, we're doing point intercept rake toss surveys um, uh, in areas where we know there's populations, so Cuyahoga Lake. Uh, and we're also targeting water bodies that are nearby um, or have a uh, high activity of recreational boating that could spread hydrilla. Um, so in addition to those activities, we're also conducting macrophyte and tuber sampling within the known populations to kind of monitor the populations um, throughout the seasons. Um, we have some other prevention and early detection efforts that we're working on as well. Um, so my colleague, Sam, will be speaking about the Watercraft Steward Program in a little bit, so I'll leave that to him. Um, we have some other education and outreach programs and it, that include um, volunteer trainings, um, webinars, other programming. Uh, we also work with the Q Lake Watershed Network to help set up and monitor and stock hydrilla information boxes. Um, we focused on areas near the current treatment locations of hydrilla and Cuga Lake, um, but we stock those with packets of how to identify hydrilla and kind of a brief overview of the activities on Cuga Lake. Um, there's a lot of resources on the PRISM website, fingerlakesinvasives.org. Um, there's a variety of, of webinars and outreach materials. Webinars are recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> and we have lots of fact sheets, lots of ID resources. Um, I still have boxes of these hydrilla posters sitting in my office. So if anybody knows of a good place to post them or wants any, um, just feel free to reach out to me and I can provide it lots. So diving into our field season, uh, we were fortunate enough to have some DEC interns to work with this summer. Um, so we were able to field a crew of seven for most of the field season. On other water bodies that are not known to have any hydrilla populations, um, we followed this survey design of our plant intercept survey. So taking a, a plant sample at set distances from each other, um, we did these surveys on 100 meter squared grids uh, within one mile of boat launches or marinas since that those are kind of hot spots of boating activity. Um, and we figure those are where, those are the locations that are susceptible to spread of hydrilla. Um, and we do rake tosses at each point up to the mile radius from the launch of marina and up to water depths of around 25 to 30 feet. Um, that is the growing range of hydrilla. In water bodies where we know there's hydrilla and we're really looking for the needle in the haystack, um, we've got a much more fine scale to our grid design. Uh, we sample on a 25 meter square grid uh, within a third of a mile. Um, roughly it's 500 meters from the launch of marina still up to water depths of 25 feet. <clears throat> so in addition to those point intercept surveys targeted around boat launches and marinas, um, we did two additional surveys uh, on Cayuga Lake this year. Um, we surveyed along the perimeter of the lake or as much of it as we could. Uh, so taking, doing a rake toss, taking a plant sample every 100 meters along the shoreline. Um, we were able to do about half of the lake uh, this field season. Um, in addition to that, uh, across the south end of Cayuga Lake, uh, we sampled on a 50 meter grid and did two rake tosses per point, just looking for the presence absence of hydrilla. Um, 
there, we did additional rank tosses as we could if, if there was uh, an observation of a dense bed of plants. Um, we did extra rake tosses there. If it's inclement weather, our field crew walked uh, marina docks and did extra rake tosses wherever they could. Um, there were also uh, our macrophyte survey program uh, had volunteers conducting rake tosses. Um, again, I think my colleague Sam will, will briefly discuss the, those data, so I won't include them here. Um, so our, our field crew is actually still out sampling. I believe this is their uh, last day in the field. So I do have our data through the end of October. Um, from, from the beginning of June through the end of October, we were able to sample 14 water bodies. Um, that was over 16,000 rake tosses. So I think that's a new record for, for a field season for us. Um, we were able to sample um, across 10 counties during 86 days in the field in that period of time. Uh, did not find any new hydrilla populations. Uh, we did have a few hydrilla detections, but they were only within the known infestations. Um, so where we had detections were, were near the Aurora population uh, in Lansing at uh, a known population and outside of Ithaca. And then zooming into Cayuga Lake, um, of the, those over 16,000 rake tosses, 9,600 were done on Cayuga Lake. About 1,700 were done to monitor the hydrilla control sites um, of King Ferry and Lansing. 766 were along the perimeter of Cayuga Lake, so our perimeter survey. Um, over 7,000 were, were a part of our point intercept surveys around boat launches and marinas. Um, <clears throat> We were also able to provide people to help the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, monitor or do their plant monitoring um, at the Ithaca and Aurora sites throughout the season. And 3,400 of our rake tosses were done across the South End. Um, we did two rake tosses on each of those little blue dots and recorded the presence or absence of hydrilla we didn't find any hydrilla on those right houses. So uh, of the macrophytes that we recorded um, throughout the field season through the end of October, this number includes unknown species, um, the, the kind of lumped together unknown native pondweed species, as well as algae, but we did record 32 submerged macrophyte species. Um, so this is across all sites uh, in the region. The most frequently encountered macrophyte was American eelgrass, uh, followed by a couple of other native species. The most frequent invasive species that we saw were Eurasian water milfoil and starry stonewort. Um, that's con consistent with what we've seen during other field seasons as well. Um, when we do rake tosses, we also record the, the total density of the plants on the rake. Um, and about a third of our rake tosses return no plants. So I do think that's interesting. Um, our finger lakes aren't entirely weedy, <laughs> very patchy. So the macrophytes on Cayuga Lake specifically, um, still 32 uh, macrophytes species were detected. Um, still consistent with uh, the rest of our sites, American eelgrass is our most frequently encountered species, um, followed by coontail and cara, and starry stonewort and Eurasian water milfoil um, <clears throat> are the most frequently encountered invasive aquatic species. And then I always like to point out, uh, I think this is our third field season in a row that we've found the state endangered uh, spiny naiad, so a native um, native aquatic plant up at the north end of the lake. Uh, throughout the field season, we recorded eight invasive species. Seven of them we did find on Cayuga Lake, with the exception of European frog bit.
Um, in addition to our, our point intercept surveys, uh, we also did a little bit of hydroacoustic data collection. Um, so recording sonar logs um, from a transducer. We sampled um, about three sites each on six different water bodies. Um, and we have that data processed uh, by, by, by BioBase, um, which gives us reports of water depth, bio volume, or um, the percentage of the water column that's filled by, by plant material, as well as bottom hardness, or kind of a, or a level of how hard the sediment is. Um, we have somebody working on putting that data output into R and creating maps. So these are two example maps of the data that we record with that. And this will ho hopefully help us um, get a sense of, of the, the different plant habitats around the lakes uh, so we can focus our survey efforts on, on good plant habitat. And I just want to kind of summarize our hydrilla management efforts, uh, at least for two of the locations on Cayuga Lake, um, King Ferry and Lansing. These are both private marinas. Uh, the King Ferry infestation was detected late fall 2018. Um, we were able to have that site dredged. I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen at all, but uh, the hydrilla was only found to be within the, the confines of that marina. Um, we did point intercept surveys around that site and did not find any hydrilla outside it. Um, so since it was a very small area, we were able to have it dredged. Unfortunately, uh, hydrilla did begin to regrow uh, a couple months later, but we worked with um, lots of stakeholders and partners, including the Army Corps of Engineers, and we were able to coordinate uh, a contact herbicide treatment um, later in 2019. We've continued to monitor the site in 2020 and 2021, and we have not found uh, hydrilla since that contact herbicide treatment back in 2019. Um, each of those little green dots is a rake toss that we took this year. And then a little bit to the south in Lansing and yet another private marina. Um, Hydrilla was reported uh, in August of 2019 at that site. Uh, we were able to do a contact herbicide treatment uh, a little bit later that fall. And then in 2020 and 2021, we've been able to fund treatment using a systemic herbicide. Um, uh, during six weekly applications, um, both summers. Uh, so this map shows where the initial hydrilla detections were um, before any treatment had happened. And then this map shows uh, the hydrilla detections from this year. So it is getting a little less dense. Uh, the treatments seem to be having an effect. Um, <clears throat> to try to monitor this Hydrilla population, we did uh, attempt a, a couple rounds of tuber sampling at that site. Um, in June of this year, uh, we used a post hole digger to collect sediment samples, um, which were sieved on site to look for any of the tubers. Uh, those samples were really collected around the edges of the marina, as well as the little connected pond uh, where it was shallow enough to collect samples. Um, we didn't find any tubers back then. We managed to get uh, some extensions put onto our post hole digger to collect the sediment samples. We were able to um, collect quite a few more samples uh, this September, late in the fall. Um, we concentrated the, the, those samplings um, around where we had been finding hydrilla this year. And again, didn't find any tubers, so I think we have uh, a low enough population density that our, our detection level is pretty low. And looking ahead, uh, we will looking to continue to control and monitor um, 
these hydrilla populations, as well as surveying additional areas um, that are susceptible to hydrilla spread, spread uh, including focusing on boat launches and marinas um, and other nearby water bodies. Um, <clears throat> And again, we have lots of educational resources, so feel free to reach out if there's uh, any volunteer trainings or other programming, um, fact sheets, things like that. And I know that was a quick overview, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kate. Kate. Catherine Monticelli. Uh, we've got about five, five minutes if, if folks would like to ask questions. Jen, are there any in the chat? Yeah, thanks, Hillary. There was one question um, that uh, Mike addressed also in the chat, uh, mentioning he will answer that question a little bit later um, in one of the, the subsequent presentations. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to um, add them to the chat at this time. We'll give everyone a couple minutes to, or just a minute or so, to to put those in. Uh, this is Hillary. I've got one. Um, I I must admit I don't know anything about the bioacoustics tool. And okay. Was wondering if you could just for a minute uh, talk about it. It's kind of cool. I mean, is it new or or have I just missed it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's. It's relatively new to me. We've been trying it out for the past couple of years to see what sort of capabilities uh, it has and just how to work with the data. Um, so we had a, a certain type of transducer installed onto um, FLI's boat and we uh, kind of drive the boat while recording the sonar in transects at certain sites. Um, we upload those sonar logs to BioBase to analyze the sonar logs and then it it provides out an output um, that we can overlay on maps and things like that so it provides us with um, uh, bathymetry mapping so the the different water depths uh, as well as how hard the the bottom is um, it's kind of an arbitrary scale but it does give a sense of is it soft is it medium is it very hard um, as well as the, the bio volume. So what percentage of the water column is filled by plant material? So is it is it topped out and, and it's just a huge patch of plants or is it very low percentage of plant material growing there? So sort of an underwater 3D representation. A little bit. Get from it. Yeah. That's pretty neat. All right. I'll Unfortunately, it doesn't give you what species are growing, so we still need to do no. lake tosses for now. But <laughs> gotcha, Jen. Are there other questions now? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That uh, gave everyone a chance to to throw their questions up. Uh, we do have a couple. Uh, first is: um, Has any hydrilla been found outside the Lansing Marina? Uh, we looked a lot, and we did not find any this year. Um, and again, we did survey within 500 meters of the marina um, and along the shoreline farther away from it. Didn't find anything. Thanks, Kate. Next question. What was the role of volunteers in the project and were they conducting rake tosses, helping with outreach, et cetera? What do those volunteers help you all do? Um, so might be referring to our volunteer program, our market price survey program, um, where we have a interested people who want to help us monitor for plants. Um, they receive sampling uh, equipment and training, and then they do rake tosses uh, wherever they have access to. Um, they sample, I think this year they did every other week and recorded what species they found and then submitted any invasive species detections to IMAP Invasives, the state invasive species database. Um, so I didn't include those data with, with all of mine, um, but they did do a lot of work this year. And I think Sam will be briefly discussing it in a little bit. Perfect. Okay, uh, question followed by a comment. Will the marinas be treated for some number of seasons after the last hydrilla find? Then the comment is treating for up to three years after last hydrilla detection has become relatively common for eradication efforts. Yes. Um, 
So King Ferry is kind of the exception with that. It has not received a treatment since 2019, but that's because we were able to have it dredged and the sediment was physically removed that brought the tubers with it. Um, for a site like our Lansing population, we'll, we expect to treat at least a few years after uh, a non-detect. Um, and I would have to double check what is in our Cuyahoga Lake Hydrilla management plan, but I think it was two or three years that we plan to treat for after our last hydrilla detection. Fortunately, we're not there yet. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, the next question is, um, on the whole, are mitigation efforts working, are populations decreasing, and what lessons have been learned? Um, so I can only really speak for the two sites that we've been uh, helping manage since I know Mike is on the line and I'm sure he'll touch base on the, the Aurora and Ithaca infestations. Um, but our, the populations at King Ferry and Lansing have decreased, so that's promising. Um, uh, lessons learned, need more eyes on the water, need lots of excited volunteers to help. It's a lot of water to cover, so. That is for sure, okay. <laughs> Move on. Um, what do we know about how much phosphorus the hydrilla does or could liberate from the sediment into the water column? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know that one. I would have to look at the literature for it. Okay. And last question for now. Um, again, there may be time at the end for additional questions, but we'll move on. So the last question, Kate, is how about the inlet in Ithaca is it now safe to dredge now some 30 plus years overdue? Well, we'll leave that one for Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Mike. You'll be learning all about it when Mike speaks up. All right, that's great. So we're gonna close uh, Q&A on Kate's presentation. Thanks so much, Kate and Hillary, over to you. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Sam Beck Anderson. And he is the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager for the Finger Lakes uh, Prism. And um, here he is. Everybody, uh, thanks Hillary and Jen and the QB Lake Watershed Network for uh, having me today. Um, Thanks, Kate, for that uh, awesome presentation of our uh, field work on Cayuga Lake this summer. I'm going to be expanding a little bit uh, on some of the things we've done uh, on Cayuga Lake this year as uh, uh, at the Finger Lakes Institute and Finger Lakes Prism, um, focusing on AIS programming in general. So sort of focusing more so uh, on uh, still technical, but really focusing more on kind of some of the human elements of the hydrilla problem um, on Cayuga Lake. Um, so I'm just gonna start talking about, uh, the, the main portion of my presentation will be about the Watercraft Steward Program uh, and all the work that they have completed uh, this year. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Watercraft Stewards are seasonal employees placed at uh, public and private uh, boat launches across the region. Um, the roles of the watercraft steward are pretty simple. Uh, the first role is uh, the physical inspection of a watercraft and removing an invasive species from watercraft as they are launching or retrieving from a body of water uh, to avoid a, a potential moving of an invasive species and an invasion to another body of water or that body that they're on. Um, Another role is the education and outreach aspect, a very important role of this program. Um, it's sort of taking a sustainable approach at prevention that includes educating boaters uh, on proper techniques for cleaning their own boat. Um, so this uh, is promoting essentially boaters kind of doing the job of the steward while we can't be there. We can't be there 24 hours, 365 days a week. Um, so we want to make sure that people out there know kind of specifically what they're supposed to do and how they can help stop the spread of invasive species. Uh, and also data collection helps us uh, make a lot of important decisions and, and valuable sort of strategic uh, developments to the program. 
Um, so really this program does, like I said, uh, um, focus on prevention uh, of invasive species being spread and ultimately detection as well through uh, the data collection and the inspections. Uh, this map here shows the uh, regional coverage uh, within our prism. This is a snapshot of the top part of our prism. Uh, there are eight programs contributing total. So just like Kate sort of gave a regional context for the work that we do, uh, this program is also regional. It's not just focused on Cayuga Lake. Um, it does kind of uh, cover a lot of ground. So um, in total, eight programs contributed to different steward programs at, uh, on different bodies of water here. Um, let's see. Get to the next. Okay, so focusing on our program specifically, we have been providing watercraft steward coverage in the Finger Lakes region since 2012. Um, on Cayuga Lake, pretty much since the inception of the program in 2012, a lot of the funding from uh, for this program comes from uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative managed through FLOPA, as well as the New York State DEC. Uh, most recently, the Prism program or the Prism fund has been uh, funding a lot of this, uh, the work on this program. Um, uh, throughout pretty much every year, our, you know, as we grow and as we learn more about this, and, and every season we learn a little bit more about the process, stewards, invasive species, specific uh, populations on water bodies, and, and the users of those water bodies, um, we're able to, you know, practice strategic management and some of this can include changes to uh, changes or just updates to the geographical range. Uh, the number of stewards is, is changing as we sort of build our capacity. Um, the management structure has been um, modified over time to support different programs, different sort of um, smaller level uh, um, desires of the program and so forth. Uh, technology is constantly changing, uh, making our jobs easier and more effective and our partners continue to uh, expand and shift uh, throughout the years. Um, for this year specifically, uh, our staffing and management, just to give an overview of who we work with, we had 23 stewards this year with uh, four lead stewards, two regional coordinators, a biology coordinator, uh, and as well, we work with a number of different folks at the Finger Lakes Institute um, to, to really help uh, bolster this program and, and make it all that it can be using different resources. You know, people like Kate are, are constantly helping us um, with, you know, difficult species identifications and things like that, that really uh, help the program thrive. Um, new to 2021 is a biology coordinator position that we added. Uh, this position bolsters and kind of um, improves steward ID skills and ecological knowledge through uh, weekly quizzes um, in person, as well as kind of uh, live troubleshooting of invasive species identifications that stewards might be having in the field. Uh, they send him a photo, they say, what is this? And, and, it, and he can help them uh, in real time kind of uh, manage those issues with identification. Um, we've also increased uh, with this position, increased the quality and consistency of our AIS reports in WISPA. Um, so we have real time quality assurance and quality checking of all the high priority invasive species findings that we uh, come across during um, the data collection process. Um, and are able to react uh, accordingly and making sure that all of everything is, is solid and we're confident with all of our findings. Um, we, like I said, the geographic range changes uh, from year to year, in some cases, uh, sometimes more than less. Um, in 2021, we added Dorchester Park down in Whitney Point Reservoir, and we also added the SOTUS Village uh, launch up on SOTUS Bay in Wayne County. Um, in 2021, and uh, excuse me, in 2020, we added uh, coverage at the Mudlock DEC launch um, right at the north end of uh, Cayuga Lake as well on that uh, had less coverage this year, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, but has did also receive coverage uh, this past year as well. Um, so just an overview, kind of zooming into Cayuga Lake, we have, uh, like I said, a little bit of change in coverage, um, changes in, in staffing as well as uh, traffic can, can lead to changes and, and kind of dropping launches sometimes. So Dean's Cove was uh, consistently on the lower end of our, our uh, launch list in terms of traffic. Um, so that essentially resulted in us kind of cutting that um, this year, um, just a combination of those uh, 
the low the low priority that we have found based on the traffic of the launch as well as staffing issues that we came in uh, across um, this past year uh, forced us to cut this launch. Um, so you see this this down here. It's it's a little bit hard to staff this launch. We have a, a hard time on the east side of, of the Finger Lakes and can. Can, can raise some problems. Uh, we do work, as you see this map, we do work uh, uh, cooperatively to sort of provide uh, supplementary coverage uh, at Keyga Lake State Park. So um, the Office of Parks and Recreation uh, has a program in accordance with, or working with SUNY ESF in Syracuse to cover at a number of boat launches across the Finger Lakes. Um, this year they did drop a, a number of, they reduced their capacity this year in stewards. So that did cause them to also drop uh, the Tucanic site uh, down here towards the south end. Uh, again, just based on uh, traffic and staffing. Um, so this year we did have five of seven of the public launches covered. Um, the way that we choose these sites, essentially, you know, we're always, we're focused on hydro ultimately. So giving priority to the sites on the Eastern side where the majority of the, uh, the pop, uh, hydrilla populations have been found um, and trying to cover as much as possible. It's another really important part about that. So as hydrilla uh, continues and, and begins to start to appear in the water column, and like I said, continues later into the season, we try our best to staff stewards on the East side of Keyuga Lake for as late into the season as possible. Um, and that is uh, shown around here, kind of given that season range ending uh, just a couple of weeks ago on um, October 30th. Um, excuse me. So just a couple of notes about, we're gonna start talking a little bit about the data collected here. So one of the main roles, like I said, of stewards is, is collecting data. Um, we collect a massive amount of data that uh, focuses on everything from time of day to, what species people are finding and where people are coming from, where people are going. And again, this tells us about the users of the boat launches in the region and as well as you know, some of the, the, the properties of the launches and, and what people are actually finding at the launches and can help us guide specific uh, decisions like giving stewards extra guidance on talking to fishermen at one site versus talking to recreationists at another site. Um, so this is just an overview of the site, uh, the coverage, and, and some of the, the really just high-level descriptive results from the steward program this year. So you can see here that we have the Finger Lakes Institute uh, at the top of each of these sections. So we have these covered uh, total. We have the people reached, and then we have the water, number of watercraft inspected. So for each uh, category here, we have the FLIs total, the parks programs total, and that overall total on the bottom. So just giving an idea of uh, just the expansive coverage that is provided on this lake um, and the, the reach essentially as well. So we're talking to tens of thousands of people um, a year and inspecting, you know, many thousands of boats between the two programs. Um, one thing that makes this possible is uh, a statewide database and data entry form called WISPA. It stands for the Watercraft Inspection Steward Program app. It is a uh, GIS-based um, software called Survey123, um, and there's a number of groups that contribute to sort of guiding this, this uh, working document and working tool for uh, programs across the state. Um, so again, our season range was right at the end of May, 529 to 1030. So um, a good amount of time that we're out there, actually, um, which we're happy about just being able to extend that program um, with a number of different uh, funding sources. The busiest days on the lake, some of them a little bit more uh, predictable than others, July 4th this year. Uh, it's not always some of those holidays. Sometimes it can be totally random days that become the most busy uh, launch on the uh, busiest days on the, on the water body, but um, followed by June 6th and uh, June 5th. So some of these having uh, almost 400 inspections per day uh, just on, on one water body is, is uh, considerable for sure. Um, so expanding a little bit into data, so really looking at some of the invasive species uh, findings, this is a great way for programs such as ours to kind of gauge the metrics and sort of uh, uh, measure success. Um, <coughs> So uh, this is a combined number of total interceptions uh, for incoming and outgoing watercraft. Um, 
Luckily, we didn't find any hydrilla this year. We did have a handful of misidentifications, which uh, of course were <clears throat> is worrying at first when we see them come up, but happily um, <clears throat> we have our, our biology coordinator that's able to react really quickly and able to do outreach uh, to the steward directly uh, on that finding. Um, all of them were really close to uh, existing hydrilla, <clears throat> excuse me, hydrilla, uh, populations. Um, so we're happy that the stewards are kind of using those context clues to actually make some some educated and sort of safe uh, guesses about some of these. Um, and, you know, I think this really is a good example of the system uh, working with us, you know, providing the training and ultimately being able to follow through on some of these um, high risk and sort of a worrying infestation. So most popular species here being curly leaf pondweed, just like Kate was saying, Eurasian water milfoil, not as much starry stonewort turning up on boats as the rake tosses themselves, but also finding a good amount of zebra mussels and other bivalves. Um, we had a total of uh, over a thousand total interceptions in coming in and out of the water body. 86% uh, of these interceptions are outgoing. So um, while that's not, you know, specifically protecting Cayuga Lake from future infestations, it does sort of reflect our kind of holistic approach to stopping prevention. So we're not just thinking about protecting Cayuga Lake, we're also thinking about um, other other water bodies nearby that people are going to be using, you know, very likely, which I'll talk a little bit about vectors in a second here. Um, so looking specifically, you know, zooming closer into looking at actually um, what the boaters look like at these different sites and kind of the, the makeup of these, we're able to ask uh, what kind of, are you fishing? Are you just kind of going out to hang out and tube and drink beer? Or are you out to, you know, very specifically uh, an angler uh, outing? So there is a pretty, these are launches are pretty varied for a single water body. Uh, typically we do see uh, in some cases water bodies kind of having like um, one or the other type of, of activity based on sort of the makeup of the water body and what sort of uh, attributes make up the water body. Um, this is pretty varied. I, I don't think it's unexpected for a lake as big as Cayuga Lake just because there are so many different areas. There's so many different parts of the lakes and so many different launch types. So um, most sites are majority fishing, uh, as we can see on Cayuga Lake. Um, overall average, though, compared to other regional boat launches. So you can see here uh, Alan Treeman being, you know, a really big, very close to sort of the biggest population center close to Cayuga Lake has a high level of uh, recreation here. So this blue color is the recreation and, and only around 20 percent is being fishing. Uh, as compared to Cayuga Lake, which is a little bit more rural, while it's still close to major uh, roadways on 20, uh, is a little bit more of a rural um, launch. But overall, taking all these uh, into consideration, this is kind of your average look um, at the Cayuga Lake uh, launches and the makeup of the users there. So, um, and then compared to all of the launches across the region, it's a little bit closer than say, um, whether if it, these, you know, uh, two launches that sort of skew in one direction towards uh, fishing and recreation respectively. Um, I was talking about vectors a little bit earlier. So thinking about where people are coming from and where people are going, um, that holistic approach uh, is, is, you know, this type of data at, uh, really helps that. So during inspections, we ask folks, where are you coming from? Um, and what, you know, what was the last water body uh, that you used with this boat? Um, we also have started recently asking or focusing and, and pushing more uh, to ask consistently where people are planning on going. Well, it isn't kind of a, a concrete, um, you know, factual kind of it gives us a better idea of the other direction. So we've always had a good idea of where people are uh, coming from, uh, but, it, but now we're able to sort of expand that idea of where people are actually going from there and where, um, you know, for Cayuga Lake, I think specifically, you know, looking at hydrilla and taking hydrilla uh, to other water bodies, I think this is even more important so that we can sort of plan at other sites or tell other programs that have these so that they can watch out for, you know, folks coming from Cayuga Lake. So um, primary vector paths are focused on nearby water bodies. So th the top two or three are usually the closest two or three water bodies. So for Cayuga Lake, Owasco, Seneca, and Skinalis being uh, the top three previous water bodies. Um, a lot of people also very commonly just use the same water body that we find is the most common 
um, you know, pathway um, from, you know, one use to the next uh, for, and then other similar next water bodies as well. So Cayuga Lake, Cayuga Lake, Oneida, Canadice, not as consistent in terms of uh, being close by, but still uh, regional at the very least. So uh, this just shows risk of spread uh, to other water bodies is, is important, uh, showing where all these could go and, and just draws attention to that idea that we should be you know, taking that approach and focusing on reducing this, you know, the likelihood and danger for other water bodies and not just their own here. So gauging interactions with boaters is also really important for us. Uh, we like to look at previous contact as sort of a gauge for uh, how effective a single boat launch is. Um, this shows mostly that most people on the launch uh, do allow us have interacted with boaters uh, or in, uh, stewards before, excuse me. Um, and this this other graph shows here that most, you know, the overwhelming majority of folks actually let us uh, inspect their boat. So this is a good sign. It shows that people on the, on the lake are used to us or have had at least uh, some experience with us. Um, so that's wrapping up our, our steward talk, but we also have a couple of other programs that I'm involved with. Uh, the Macrophyte Survey Program uh, on Cayuga Lake was pretty active this year. We had six volunteers. Um, we had 18 individual rake toff samples entered into IMAP invasives, uh, at least. Um, we're still uh, uh, processing data, but these are sort of the pre preliminary numbers here. We did have two false hydrilla reports, uh, both close to existing populations from the same person, uh, Evan. And Bennett here. Um, so just like our stewards reporting hydrilla in, in nearby locations, ultimately we are happy about this um, and it, it helps us to sort of exercise that process of getting a report and being able to respond to the report really quickly. Um, this is just a, a brief overview of, of some of the most common species. So for native species, again, just like Kate said on the rakes, uh, mostly finding LOD at Coontail. Um, American eelgrass and native pondweed and water stargrass, the mostly common invasives being Eurasian water milfoil, star stone or curly leaf pondweed. Uh, we are hoping to enhance engagement uh, in 2022 on this program. If anybody here is interested in getting involved, please feel free to reach out. I'm sure Hillary will be able to uh, provide my email address at the end. Um, we also did a one pole uh, water chestnut pole as part of our early detection rapid response program. Um, there was just one population monitor. This is right by uh, Key Lake State Park. Um, all accounts, all accounts of the uh, kind of the results of this outing uh, point to uh, decline, you know, continued decline of biomass and number of rosettes. Uh, only one site was monitored here in 2021. Uh, it involved three volunteers, three FLI staff who pulled just about 10 pounds. So good signs in terms of uh, water chestnut on the lake and we'll, you know, we'll be continuing monitoring through the Macrophyte Survey Program, as well as you know, the field work that we're doing that Kate just outlined with the thousands of rake tosses that they do to help inform uh, future water chestnut um, management on the lake. Um, <clears throat> looking forward, uh, we're gonna be continuing to uh, emphasize biology-based support for stewards. We're really happy with the way that worked this year and I think uh, makes a huge difference to sort of the, um, the capacity of the program to make you know, solid identifications and kind of the, um, the quality of the data that we're collecting, which we're really happy about. Um, we're also going to be continuing to emphasis to emphasize human behavior. So not just educating people, but really trying to make uh, you know, choices in terms of our outreach to, to encourage people to actually uh, change their behavior uh, towards, you know, cleaning their boats and, and uh, practicing, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, behaviors that promote the prevention of invasive species spread, uh, looking for higher engagement on volunteer programs, um, and to expand our focused hydrilla outreach on Cuba Lake as well. Uh, just a quick thanks to our many, many partners that we've worked with on the steward program, as well as our other uh, AIS programs and acknowledging our stewards and staff and uh, funding sources here, as well as some of our references. So uh, happy to take any questions if we have time for them. Thanks, Sam. That was uh, really wonderful. I greatly enjoy your, your talks. Um, uh, do, do folks have questions? I've got 
One, I know that last year in 2020, your your efforts were somewhat affected by the uh, pandemic. And I was wondering, um, what was that like from 2020 to 2021? Yeah, so in 2020, uh, pretty much across the state, based on that WISPA data that we're able to um, collect, uh, in 2020, the traffic at launches was significantly increased. Um, launch to launch, it did vary specific percentage wise, but the state was saying somewhere between like 20 and 35% on average at, at sites. So just that's just inspection. So you can imagine that, you know, actual traffic could even be increasing more than that. Um, compared to pre pandemic numbers, um, I believe in 2021, we were still slightly elevated at some locations, but not quite to the level of 2020. Okay. Maybe people's desire for nature will calm down slightly. <laughs> yes, we'll see. It might be a good time to buy a used boat in the next couple of years because of <laughs> how many people tried to get into the hobby and maybe weren't uh, so into it. Sure. Um, Jen, any, any other questions come up? Yeah, so, so far, just one question. So feel free to put them in the chat if anyone has anything else. Uh, but the one question that's here, Sam, is do each of the state parks have boat stewards? And if so, what time frame um, are they on location? So what months of the year do they operate? Yeah, so Parks uh, has historically operated a similar program to ours. It's been a similar uh, scale in terms of the number of stewards. This past year, though, just due to funding issues related to COVID, uh, they did have to operate um, it's, it's parks and ESF are now working on that project together. Uh, they did have to operate at about half capacity this year. So they did only have a handful of stewards in our region and only about 10 statewide. Um, so to answer the question quickly, no, definitely not all launches have stewards. Um, we try to, just because of the reason that we know that parks on, on our end, we know that parks um, are typically busy. They're not always the busiest launches on a lake, but they are typically, you can count on a pretty good traffic there. Um, so a lot of them are covered and we do try to make a, a, we at least try to make an effort to provide at the very least enough coverage to know the traffic at that site to compare it to other uh, launches within a water body. But um, time frame really does depend. So for example, we, we were at Long Point, uh, pretty late this year. Um, I think somewhere in October, we were able to be there, uh, have a little bit of coverage there. Uh, unfortunately, it really just, it, it varies year to year based on um, staffing. We had some problems with staffing this year with people not sticking with the job. So we actually had like three different trainings this year. So one at the beginning of the year, one in the middle of the year, and one at the very end of the year, just to try to get uh, enough coverage to cover the most high priority boat launches you know, usually being Cayuga is always on our high priority list because of the Hydrilla, specifically Long Point, Frontenac Park, and Union Springs is another one that we cover uh, really heavily just because it's on that, that east side of the lake is, and has, you know, a, a lot of a lot of traffic there. Okay, one more quick question, Jen. Yeah, um, so a follow-up to that, um, Sam, is given that boat stewards are on the front line of the ID effort, what tools do they and boaters wish were available to contain the spread? Uh, they use, for example, boat wash stations, properly located weed boxes. Yeah, so I, I can... I think I can safely speak for stewards and say that uh, we would definitely benefit regionally from uh, boat wash stations. Um, historically, they haven't really been included in a lot of the recent steward related funding opportunities. Um, the DC is just, they are, they do work and they are being utilized in other parts of the state. So specifically, the Adirondacks has the highest concentration of boat wash stations. Uh, for people that don't know, this is basically a hot water pressure washer. Uh, they can be very expensive. They can be uh, they do scale down a little bit to sort of a, a local, a more local level, but the infrastructure is expensive. There's more liability. There's more training. Um, ultimately, they they are expensive and, and they can be a little bit complicated. Um, I think in an ideal world, every steward would have one, probably, um, or wherever it's it's really necessary. 
Um, weed boxes, I think, is another uh, solid um, tool for a steward. Um, and just sort of also just for that passive outreach and also a passive kind of opportunity to uh, draw people in and, and create, just making kind of those clean, drain, and dry efforts uh, that much easier for voters. If they see the box, they say, all right, this is where I put my stuff. I'm going to go ahead and, and put it there and, and uh, be done with it. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, that's very you. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to move to our uh, third speaker, Michael or Mike Greer, who has a career with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Buffalo office, uh, combining engineering with nature, which is um, kind of interesting. And Mike in this is wearing his invasive species specialist hat to talk to us today about uh, the work the Army Corps has been doing on Cuba Lake regarding um, hydrilla. Thank you. All right, thank you, Hillary. It's great to be back again this year and provide a report on what we've been able to accomplish this past year. And really appreciate the robust attendance really it drives home how important the lake and the value of these resources are to the community. Let's get this pulled up here. All right, can everybody see my screen? I hope so. It disappears. The rest yeah. of the Zoom meeting kind of disappears yeah. on me. But, Looks good. Yeah, you're good. Um, so I'm gonna, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to cover two demonstration projects that we're leading, one at Aurora and one at the south end of the lake um, near Ithaca. Now we can conduct the demonstration programs under the Aquatic Plant Control Research Program Authority. It's provided by the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1958 as amended. So actually our work in, in this line of business goes back quite a ways and actually back much further than that but that's kind of the modern authority that we use for this work. Um, I also really want to thank um, Rich Ruby and Mike Voorhees in particular for stepping in this year and taking on some new leadership roles in the project. I was actually on a detail to our research lab um, all summer and, you know, interacted with the team a little bit here and there, but Mike and Rich really did a great job um, continuing the great work that we've been doing the past several years. Um, but really, uh, at the end of the day, this is a group effort. We've got a tremendous number of partners that help us side by side, you know, make this be successful. Um, whether it's the village, the state, other federal agencies, um, Kivu Lake Watershed Network, PRISM, uh, Finger Lakes Institute, there are many, many, many partners. And, you know, the day-to-day -day interactions that we have with the community and those partners is invaluable. Um, so I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation going over uh, some of the project goals. Here besides we used the details of the treatment and the water monitoring, the point intercept results similar to what Kate showed. And then we'll talk a little bit about the next steps um, for 2022. You know, so at the end of the day, highest level goal for the project, we're trying to protect what's important, right? Um, public safety, responsible use of well understood herbicides. While these are demonstration projects, they are not demonstrating um, unproven herbicides, right? All of the herbicides that we use have a long track record, well understood. It's really just about how we go about using them and fine tuning their use. Uh, to achieve the project objectives, right? And that really brings me to the second point here. Um, restore the Great Lakes, the Finger Lakes, protect the ecological and economic benefits that those water bodies provide, right? We know hydrilla can ex expand really rapidly, become very dense and really detract in a significant way from ecological benefits of the water bodies. And that also has economic um, damages that go along with it. 
people are able to use those water bodies to their fullest. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we want to make sure that we reduce the risk of spread. Um, having it in Cavu Lake is not good, but having it in many, many more lakes is even worse. So that's kind of what we're trying to accomplish with the project. Uh, Cuga Lake, there's um, two active ingredients that we use, three different formulations. Um, the first we use on a limited basis really to spot treat and help assist areas where maybe we're not getting good control using the other two herbicides. Um, and that's chelated copper, the specific trade name here is Harpoon. It's uh, very safe uh, as long as you're using it in relatively small quantities over limited periods of time, there really aren't any significant adverse impacts to the environment, fish, invertebrates, things of that nature. Um, very, very few um, restrictions and um, very safe to use in and around portable water sources. Uh, Sonar H4C is a fluoridone uh, formulation that is in pellet form. Uh, this is the primary herbicide that we use at our Kiwi Lake sites. Um, again, been used for a long time, very well understood. Um, got a summary of the water use restrictions here. It's pretty forgiving, um, particularly at the rates that we're using. We, the maximum rate that we treat at is 20 parts per billion. And um, the average concentrations that we see in the water, I'll cover later, but they're typically somewhere around uh, one to three parts per billion. So you know, it's pretty unusual for us to trigger any of these use restrictions and there's not a lot of, not a lot or any um, nursery greenhouse hydroponic concerns. Um, so in our Genesis is a liquid formulation of fluoridone and has essentially the same use restrictions as sonar. Uh, the sonar H4C pellet, sorry. All right, so now I'll get into some of the details at Aurora. All right. Um, <clears throat> so based on 2020 results, we formulated two main treatment plots. They are highlighted here in gold or orange. Um, again, the primary herbicide that we're using within those areas is the Sonar H4C um, formulation of fluoridone. Uh, we start off the season with two applications at 20 parts per billion to try and bring the active ingredient concentration in the water column up. And then that's followed by eight applications of 13.75 parts per billion. Um, that total brings us up to the season limit um, application for uh, sonar H4C or fluoridone, which is 150 parts per billion. Um, this year in Aurora, we treated on a slightly different schedule. Um, it was on Wednesdays, again, that occurred weekly, started on June 30th, ended September 1st, and that's uh, pretty consistent with the schedule that we've been using. Uh, the last few years, um, or at least with respect to the start and end dates. Unfortunately, through our regular monitoring of the site, which would include everything that's outlined in light blue, um, we did start to find some hydrilla a little bit north of our northern treatment plot. So we, we came up with a, a north two plot. Um, and over the course of events, we were actually able to delineate a line of hydrilla through this plot. Um, we found it relatively early and were able to, to come up with a strategy and get approval to um, treat this with copper and sonar H4C. Um, we used that combination because by the time we were actually able to treat um, the plants had already started to grow and emerge from the sediment and become fairly robust. So at that point, it takes a little bit more to knock those plants down versus these other two plots. We start applying early in the season. 
as the plants just begin to emerge from the sediment and they're much more susceptible to the herbicide um, when they're at that smaller growing stage. Uh, with respect to the water monitoring, it's a really important component um, of the project um, in terms of understanding public safety and making sure that we're within the appropriate thresholds. And it also helps us understand um, how effective our treatments are in combination with our point intercept surveys. Uh, so we, we shoot to maintain a concentration of fluoridone in the water that's somewhere between one and three parts per billion. Um, Pretty tough to maintain in this kind of open water environment in the lake. Um, we're out there weekly. We collect at all of these sites. Um, there are more points that we collect at other points during the growing season. I'm not showing any of those here, but those are mostly collected to help us understand the efficacy there. How, what concentration of fluoridone are we really maintaining in the water? And it, it's really variable site to site week to week, but the range is typically between one and, well, what we saw this past year was one in uh, 2.6 parts per billion. Most commonly, um, the result is less than one part per billion um, for this particular test that we're using for our weekly monitoring. Um, the detection limit is one part per billion, um, so we're typically below that. But we do have many hits um, on a week-to-week -week basis that are anywhere from one to 1 1.8 parts per billion. So this is what helps give us confidence um, combined with our point intercept surveys that we're maintaining uh, concentration that's needed to kill the hydrilla and is a little bit more forgiving on some of the other plants that are found within the treatment areas. Uh, in addition to collecting samples in the lake proper, um, samples are collected weekly from the water treatment plant at Wells College and all of those samples came in this year uh, less than 0.5 parts per billion and those drinking water samples are actually analyzed using a different method at um, at CSI down in Ithaca and their detection limits just a little bit lower uh, so that's why we're reporting here at less than half a part per billion need to uh, and be mindful of time here. Um, so again, I've mentioned point intercept surveys uh, a couple of times. So similar to the grid that Kate showed, we have a grid that covers this entire area. Um, we use a combination of a 50 meter and a 25 meter grid to monitor, monitor um, plant abundance and frequency within the project area. Uh, Overall, hydrilla was less than 1.7% frequency throughout the year. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit of a breakout on this, but um, by the end of the year, our results were actually fairly good in this treatment area, right? We had, within the area that we treated, we actually had pretty good control. And that may be a little harder to see here because this is cumulative. Some of these points we would have found either prior to treatment or very early in the treatment. Uh, we do still um, see a very good abundance of other aquatic plants within the system throughout the season. Okay, so on this particular map, um, I've cut out all of our early sampling points and just showing September and October, which are end of the growing season or past the growing season. And you can see there really are very few, if any, hydrilla points that are popping up within the treatment areas. Unfortunately, we do see some hydrilla that's popping up adjacent to those treatment areas. And, uh, you know, that's an area for concern and something that we've got to come up with a better strategy for moving forward. But again, you know, we really need to underscore that these herbicides are effective, they're safe, now it's just coming up with um, efficient ways to use those so that we control the hydrilla, manage, have uh, manageable budgets, and aren't having too many other um, unintended consequences on the lake ecosystem. Uh, here's the bad news. And that, 
you know, I, I can't tell you how disappointed I am to have to, to share this. Um, but I'm also, I also want to say it's not the end of the world. Um, this is not catastrophic. It's not good, but it is definitely not catastrophic, something that's manageable. Um, so here's the blue area that we monitored regularly. And you've seen that in all of the previous figures. Um, after finding the points in the more northern area and some of these down in the southern area, we started to get um, some scuba, dive, scuba diver assistance on our point intercept surveys and doubled down some of our point intercept surveys, you know, expanding out of the normal range. And unfortunately, we started to see hydrilla uh, creeping, up, creeping up the northern shoreline and similar uh, creeping down the southern shoreline to just a little bit past Long Point State Park. Um, the good news is we, we did spend a lot of time a lot of effort really um, by diver assisted means and point intercept surveys to try to find the maximum extent of that hydro level. And we're fairly confident, very confident that these are the limits of hydrilla within the area. Um, so that, those surveys were conducted you know, from mid-July through October, we weren't able to just go out there and do this all at once. Um, in terms of context for level of effort, the blue area down to about here that we normally survey, that was about a 125 acres when we expanded it to include that purple treatment area I showed on one of the previous slides that brought us to 195 acres. Um, we went from surveying 370 points in our point intercept surveys to a thousand. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work, uh, but needed uh, to help monitor the efficacy of the project. So looking forward to 2022, this entire area from the northernmost point to the southernmost point, it's about 430. So it's a pretty significant increase, but it is still manageable and certainly much easier than managing the entire lake or an entire side of the lake. Um, I don't know exactly what percentage of the shoreline of the lake this would be, but it would be relatively small, right? So we, we just need to keep this in perspective. We'll have some time for questions and discussion on this, I'm sure. All right, so I want to move on to Ithaca. What am I doing on time? Not too bad. I'll speed it up just a little bit, but I don't want to miss any important points here. Uh, so Ithaca, down at the south end of the lake, it's oriented quite a bit different. So here's a figure that just shows all of the, the different treatment areas that we have in that part of the lake. And I'm going to walk you through each of these individually and give you the details of what was done. Um, but we really try to look at where are we finding the plants? Where were they at the end of the previous season? We look at our water monitoring results, understand where are we maintaining the concentrations that we want? Where are they maybe a little high? Where are they a little low? And we're constantly making adjustments. You'll see some of that on these next slides. Um, so Fall Creek, we've done some spot treatments in here previously, but this was the first year we really got back to what I would consider full scale treatment of Fall Creek. Um, 2020, we had some hydrilla in the golf course lagoon and these other two lagoons that are just kind of off the main stem. And we were finding a little bit of hydrilla right along the bank in a couple of spots um, in Fall Creek. So what we did here was use the sonar H4C formulation in these little side channels. Um, and then we use the sonar genesis drip, which is the liquid formulation. Um, and that was applied through an injection system that uh, targets 2.5 part per million daily rate based on creek flow. There's some 
fancy electronics that go into this. Uh, but it will adjust based on daily flows. And anytime the flow was above 100 CFS, that system was shut down um, because at that point, the product, the herbicide is really moving out of the system too fast to have any effect. Um, this year being an unusually wet year, um, that sonar genesis drip system was turned off quite a bit. Um, and we didn't use near as much herbicide as we anticipated using, probably only about half. All right, the uh, Stewart Park and Cornell Community Sailing Club plots, that's an area that we've been working on for several years. Uh, we get very good control here. These, these areas um, are an area where we've been able to reduce the application rate pretty significantly. Unlike Aurora, we're able to get pretty good um, resonance time. There's not a huge turnover in the water. Um, so we get pretty good concentrations and we've dropped uh, our follow-up applications from 13.7 five to nine parts per billion. And again, we're still seeing really good concentrations here throughout the treatment season. And there may be some opportunity um, to reduce that even a little bit further. That's something we'll evaluate. I uh, started applying here at the very beginning of the season, similar to Aurora, um, July 1st through the beginning of September. Uh, Treatment State Marine Park, just the other side of the inlet. Um, been treating this area for the same amount of time. A uh, little bit, well, same schedule in, in terms of the calendar, but the rate is a little bit higher here. They're smaller plots, they're not contiguous, and we've maintained that 220, 813.75 part per billion applications these two particular plots and they're relatively small. Okay, moving into the inlet, we uh, anticipated being on the 220 and the 813.75 application schedule. We've been on Thursdays, the same as the rest of the areas treated down at the southern end of the lake. We had some permit challenges with the New York State Canal Corporation, um, which prevented us from starting our application until the middle of July. So we were somewhere between two and three weeks behind schedule on this. Um, no need to extend past that early September end date though, because at that point, the growing season is really wrapping up. So what we did was we took that 150 parts per billion that were allowed for the season and then redistributed that in a way that would hopefully allow us to catch up and, and get on top of some plants that are a little bit more mature in this part of the project. Um, we did show some regrowth, um, particularly in this part of Cascadilla Creek and around the uh, Cornell crew um, boathouse, that little bay that's right there um, next to their facilities. Um, so we came back and used some copper, harpoon um, spot treatments in those areas to try and get a little bit better control and um, you know, make sure those plants weren't putting out tubers for the next growing season. Uh, Application there, the application rate for the harpoon granular is one part per million. All right, similar to Aurora, um, we monitor the herbicide concentration in the water column weekly, and we do collect additional samples to evaluate efficacy, but we want to make sure that um, public safety is coming first and foremost, and we understand the concentrations that are in the water and that we're also maintaining the concentrations that are needed for effectiveness on hydrilla. Again, that range for effectiveness on hydrilla would typically be somewhere between one and three parts per billion. Uh, 
the range down here in Ithaca, uh, less than one to 4.3 parts per billion. Most common, less than one, but we see quite a few um, samples that were in the one to two part per billion range. Uh, and there's some in the three, some in the low four, but a good chunk of them fall in this range, which gives us really good confidence combined with our point intercept data that we're getting the control that we had, and uh, saw it. Uh, Bolton Point collects water samples. They pr process them weekly for analysis, also at CSI, and all of those results this year were reported less than a half a part per billion. All right, good news here. Uh, point intercept sampling, less than 1% for all the dates. By the end of the growing season, which is kind of the most important one, helps us understand where we left off. We were at less than a quarter percent frequency of hydrilla in all of our point intercept sampling. Um, what we did see though was, even though we did come in and try and rescue these areas with a little bit of a, a copper application, not sure we quite got the got across the finish line at the Cornell Rowing Club um, and also here in Cascadilla Creek. The little bit or the, the points that you find here in Fall Creek and out in front of Stewart Park, those were relatively early in the season. We did not find them later in the season. So it's relatively safe to assume that those were addressed um, through the herbicide app. All right, so uh, path forward. We still have quite a bit of work to do um, in terms of data processing and ana analysis. Most of it got done by today. Um, thanks, Hillary, for scheduling the meeting. That, that uh, forces our hand a little bit and keeps us on schedule. I appreciate that. Um, but we do still have a little bit more work to do there to clean things up. And um, we are in the process of preparing formal post-treatment summary reports that really capture everything that was in this presentation and more in a formal way that's available to share with folks so that they know exactly what happened. And really within a matter of weeks, we'll start conferring with um, all the stakeholders and experts that we normally do and draft plans for 2022. Sorry, that's a mistake there. Um, that should be 2022. Um, so, Again, no, nothing formal there yet, but um, off the top of our head, you know, working on ways to address Aurora and split that effort with the New York State DEC so that that can be affordable and get, in, get addressed to the fullest extent and, and get that site back under control. So we will be, um, we'll be doing that and have been talking to the New York State DEC about how to split that treatment and, uh, you know, again, just scrubbing our data and trying to get as lean and mean and accurate on um, the work at um, the south end of the lake um, as we can. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions um, or have a little bit of discussion, but here are some additional resources if you're interested in the subject. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, that was uh, comprehensive and um, I think, uh, you know, tells us that it's a hard fight against hydrilla. Um, and it seems to be uh, sneaky or canny. I don't want to give it a mind, but, uh, you know, I, I see how well things are working if you work really hard and focus in many, many areas at the south end. And it looks like in Aurora, you don't quite have a handle on it yet, but, uh, but you will. Um, and I, I think that towns around the lake need to uh, be paying attention to uh, your, uh, your study areas and the ones that the Phenol Lakes Prism are doing because uh, it may be showing up at other, at other places in the, in the future. Um, we've got time for a few questions here. Uh, but I also want to remind folks that this presentation is being recorded 
and it'll be available soon at the Eagle Lake Watershed Network's YouTube channel. So, Jen, are there questions for Mike? Yeah, we had a couple come in. Um, also wanted to invite people at this time, if they'd like to turn on their cameras, please feel free to do that. Um, and after we have addressed the written questions, um, if folks wanna unmute and ask questions in person, you're welcome to do that as well. We, we will let you know. Um, but the first uh, question that came in was um, about hydrilla and starry stonewort and says, would the hydrilla treatment area near Allen Treeman Lake also um, chock full of starry stonewort, is there consideration to address both species at this location? Uh, that would be nice. Um, starry stonewort is relatively new, not well understood, and it's probably not going to respond to the herbicides that we're using the same way that hydrilla does. Hydrilla is actually relatively sensitive to the herbicides we're using as compared to many other plant species. Um, so um, it's not likely that the work we're doing will have any negative impact on the starry stonewort. Okay. Understand why starry stonewort's a concern though. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Uh, someone was curious about the exact conflict with the canal authority and uh, that caused the delay in the treatment. Uh, they require us to get a work permit that includes an insurance certificate and we, our contractor had some challenges getting the insurance, the proper insurance certificate from their company, which led to the delay in the work permit. And the last um, entry into the chat was actually a comment about Aurora. Um, I don't know if folks want to read this or if you'd like me to read it. Um, but for those not reading it, it says the total area that has hydrilla in it is 438 acres, which is approximately 4.1% of the total lake area that ranges from zero to 18 feet in depth. There's approximately five miles of shoreline affected, which is approximately 5% of the 95 miles of overall shoreline. Yeah, thank you, Rich. That really helps keep it in perspective. That's great. Um, feel free to uh, put some more comments in. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself at this point if you would like to. Uh, one final comment that came in here, Mike, is dredging the inlet safe now or no? Yeah, so it's safe to, but there there may still be considerations with how to deal with that material. Right. So um, I would also say the timing of the dredging would be relatively important. You wouldn't want to do that in the middle of the summer when it would be easy to spread fragments. Right. So early in the season or end of the season when the risk of spread would be low. Um, and you, right, so the inlet is another core um, flood control project that was implemented in partnership with the city or the state. Um, so I got to be a, a little bit sensitive there. I know um, there's other things driving the need in, in the discussion on dredging. The inlet, right? but hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, this will be on our YouTube channel soon. Uh, I also want to let you know that we're working on putting together a presentation in the next few weeks by uh, USPS uh, Bill Capel, who is going to uh, give a reprise of his classic presentation about lake levels in the lake and how they work because we've had such a problem with flooding and damage to people's beaches, the shorelines, docks, and so on. And uh, we hope to have uh, some commentary from the network's chair, David Wolf, at that time about uh, climate change and its role in uh, now trying to uh, deal with lake levels in Cuba Lake. Uh, but for now, thank you everybody so much for being here for these uh, three great uh, updates about what's happening with Hydrilla.
on Cayuga Lake. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.